In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Good evening, friends, and welcome to the 21st episode of Crime and Punishment, a legal podcast, not a political one. It is, in fact, the official podcast of the Invictus Law Firm PA, a criminal defense law firm in orlegustusinvictus.com. And that is me, your host for the evening, and I'm here with my trusty co-host, Tiger Jin. Tiger, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, I hear you. Rock and roll. So what about the chat? (laughs) Now, does the chat hear us? That's right. So we had a serious technical problem there. And now we've got more problems because YouTube is hiding our friends chats for whatever reason. I don't know what's going on. Uh, So anyway, we had a serious technical problem there. It's not Mercury Retrograde. It's my own technical incompetence. We're working on that day by day. So we've got lots of news. We've taken a summer vacation, which is to say I've been spending as much time as I possibly can with my baby boys, Cesare and Odysseus. And uh, sorry, but uh, I'm not sorry. So we've uh, got a lot of news, though. We've got a huge backlog of news. All right, they hear us this time. We've also discovered in our time off, guys, that uh, what we're going to do from now on, for the first five or ten minutes, we're just going to chit-chat. Because mm-hmm. that's the secret to success for all of these podcasts. We just go straight to business, no lube. And uh, we just can't seem to grow our following. Yeah. So, I mean, just we'll talk <laughs> a bit and... Um... Make sure everything is good and all that. I feel like it's good. Everybody's saying they can hear us both, but uh, just in case, you know, I've been yeah. drinking Tazo green tea, Zin green tea. Ah. I've all, uh, thanks to my friend yeah. who will remain nameless, I've been developing a bad coffee habit. But uh, I'm going to have to get back off that and just stick with the green tea. You know what? Maybe one of these days I should send you some long... That... Gesundheit. That is... <laughs> so that is Dragon Well Tea. That is um, pretty well the original green tea, and it originated in uh, my other hometown of Hangzhou, China. And you can still... It's still grown there. It's still farmed there. And it is amazing. It is a loose leaf tea that we drank and it's just about my favorite beverage there is well not to be snobby but my favorite tea is unsweet tea from panera as everybody knows that is the best tea on earth black tea (laughs) black is the texas oil it's beautiful (laughs) but i will Come down from my high horse, and I will try your loose leaf gesundheit. Tea. <laughs> it, yeah, uh, for for me, I'm all about the Chinese tea. What Western teas to me, it tastes like some kind of medicine, and I'm just like, <laughs> hey, I'm all about the about Chinese teas, especially loose leaf, um, because then you you can actually eat the leaves, especially with long jing cha. It's good to eat the leaves as well. Everything's good about it. Yeah, my kids, uh, I've, all, I've drank Panera's unsweet tea forever. I, we are not sponsored by Panera, unfortunately, <laughs> but we will be. But I've, uh, I've been drinking it for years, you know, since law school. My, uh, anyway, my kids, um, ever since they were little kids, they've called it grass tea. Uh, <laughs> so they would, like, drink sips of dad's tea. And uh, it was grass tea. That they think it tastes like grass, which yeah, that's goes what people to your say point. about Long Jing Cha about uh, Dragon Well tea. Oh, well, then I'll so love many it. people that I give it to, they they're like, oh, it tastes like grass. <laughs> I like it already, Tiger. <laughs> Sounds like my kind of tea. <laughs> um, let's see. The inundation here is saying he rewatched John Dolman's Borgia. Uh, better than Jeremy Irons' Borgia. I don't know which is which, but I, the European Borgia is the good one. The Showtime one, I was not a fan of, but 
I never really gave it a chance because the European one was so good. Um, anyway, how's that for chit chatting? You want to get to the yeah. articles? <laughs> I'm really yeah. dying. I'm dying to talk about this article, man. Yes. Um, so, in the last run of episode 20, uh, 21, um, we went on for 15 minutes about this article that is so important. Uh, that we didn't even check the chat to see that nobody could hear what we were saying. So this time, this time we're going to run on it for like 45 minutes. And uh, now we know it's fine. Pope reverses Benedict, reimposes restrictions on Latin mass. Now for the uninitiate, those who are not Catholic, those who do no not know anything about Catholic history or the Catholic Church, that is a lot to unpack in one headline. First of all, this is an article from ABC News, which is far from being some right-wing outlet. Uh, ABC News, I was just listening to Patrick Buchanan's um, The Greatest Comeback about Richard Nixon, and they were talking about how ABC was the one who first went after to try to disembowel Nixon, and they actually used a convicted communist spy to do it. historically not friendly to the right-wing. They're obviously not right-wing, but... Check out this subtitle. Pope Francis has cracked down on the celebration of the Old Latin Mass by reversing one of Pope Benedict XVI's signature decisions. Interesting language because that's exactly what the traditionalists are saying. So we're not reading the article from the New York Times because I refuse to buy a subscription to that. We're not going to play a video by Dr. Taylor Marshall because we just don't have an hour to do that, even though he is the expert. We're going to read ABC News because even with them being part of this whole globalist movement that would fully support the Second Vatican Council, uh, even they're using the exact language that the right-wing lunatics in the Catholic Church would use. And again, we can call them right-wing lunatics because we have no political positions here on crime and punishment. We love Big Brother as much as the next guy. And we're just reading the news as attorneys. This article is from Rome. It says, Pope Francis cracked down Friday on the spread of the old Latin mass, Vic the 16th's signature decisions, and a major challenge to traditionalist Catholics who immediately decried it as an attack on them and the ancient liturgy. Now, cracked down on it, the spread of the old Latin mass, that alone is a lot to unpack. Because most people don't know that there has been, in the past several years, a massive resurgence of the Latin Mass. I've mentioned uh, the young pope on this program before. Tiger, have you watched that yet? I really should. I want to. I just have not well, been able to watch. I haven't watched anything since my kid was born. <laughs> I've watched nothing. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. I'm not recommending that anyone watch it. Uh, I'm just mentioning it as a, a cultural phenomenon. Uh, it is absolutely degenerate. I'm not going to make any bones about that. There, do not let kids watch it. Uh, if you're a virgin, I wouldn't recommend watching it. Uh, it's bad. Like it's, but it's also brilliant. It's a, uh, it's a work of art. I think I love the show. But then again, I am. A famous degenerate. So, anyway, in that show, uh, Pope Pius the Thirteenth, obviously a reference to Pius, uh, the traditionalist, the SSPX, the, the very people being attacked by this new law by Pope Francis. Um, he is trying to revive in that show the Tridentine Mass, the Latin Mass. Interestingly, in the second season, the new Pope. Uh, the guy who takes over, long story short, they name him Pope Francis II, and it appears to be a direct attack on Pope Francis. It's a fascinating show, but this whole, this whole conflict between the traditionalists who want the Latin Mass and the ancient liturgy, them against the Novus Ordo, the New Order, the Second Vatican Council folks who want the Mass in uh, their vernacular languages. There's a vulgar language um, who want it to be 
more Protestant and less Catholic. Uh, that conflict has erupted. Uh, this just happened. It's something that everybody knew was going to happen. It's just the writing was on the wall. And now... What really gets me is it happened on the 16th, like so close to the weekend when there are masses of obligation. Like this Pope gave zero time for the bishops to figure this thing out. Well, there's that. At least the next Holy Day of Obligation isn't until August 15th. But yeah, that being on a Friday and masses on Sunday... Well, a lot of bishops, by my understanding, are saying, well, we've got the law, now let's interpret the law. Yeah. And let's sit on it and take some time to think about this. So yeah. I don't think it really affected anybody's Sunday. Knock on wood. Although, I mean, I'll bet there are I, a lot of people. I see some a lot people of places. on the internet saying it has. I, I don't know. I know my bishop has already announced that he is allowing our Latin Mass to continue. Really? Uh, yeah. So That's surprising for your neighborhood. Yeah, I was surprised too. And you know what? Um, in the article here, I, I I have a little bit of a feeling. I, I actually wonder if I helped save it because one of the things is that, um, where did it say here? It's where I tried to jump in last time we were talking. But essentially, part of the order is that the Latin Mass churches are not suppressing the Novus Ordo. And when I was in one of my classes with the priest, I asked him, hey, if I can't make it to the Latin Mass, should I go to the Novus Ordo one for the Masses of Obligation? And he said, oh, absolutely. If if you can't make it to ours, go to the Novus Ordo. And so I'm wondering if, like, my priest was there in discussion with the bishop and said, hey, I'm not suppressing anything. Just last week I told this guy to go to Novus Ordo. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's still, it's communion, you know. Um, There's only so much you can say without becoming political, without taking a side in it. So, like I always say, we're just reading the news. We're not taking one stance or another. Uh, but, first of all, Michael Moore says T-nationalism on our opening discussion. That's, the Michael Moore? Yeah, I guess uh, the Michael Moore. Wow. Straight from Flint, Michigan with his uh, See, we're, we're, we're apolitical. We got both sides coming here. That's right. That's right. We're already proving it. Um that's got to be a T-shirt. I got to write that down. We're doing T-nationalism for crime and punishment. Uh, Rundus is asking whether I go to SSPX Mass now. Let me write down T-nationalism before I get into that one. <clears throat> so the short answer is yes, and I guess that's all I'm going to say. That we're going to stick with the short answer, yeah, because we're not going to get. Political, we're not going to take a side in this. We are just reporting the news. We just happen, Tiger and I, to attend Latin Mass, but we take no stake in this on crime and punishment. Um, the ending of the young pope was so horrible, though. Well, we're not going to give any spoilers here. I actually think, I've heard it's a trilogy, I don't, I don't know if that's ever going to materialize, but I, I think the, fir- the first and second seasons complement each other well. But uh, yeah, no spoilers here. You know what? We've, we've got an article. We've got to read this article. Hold on. Getting so in the chat, I forgot we were reading. We've also discussed this already <laughs> once. <so. laughs> um, Francis reimposed restrictions on celebrating the Latin Mass that Benedict relaxed in 2007 and went further to limit its use. The pontiff said he was taking action because Benedict's reform had become a source of division in the church and been exploited by Catholics opposed to the Second Vatican Council, the 1960s meetings that modernized the church and its liturgy. What an amazing statement. We're not going to take a position. I'm just going to point out. How amazing it is to say that relaxing the restrictions on the Latin Mass that had been under attack since the 1960s, that is what's causing the division. 
Not the Second Vatican Council that happened in the 60s that completely overturned the Latin Mass. No, that, that didn't cause any division at all. It was Pope Benedict saying, yeah, let's let these guys do their thing. That is causing division? What it really is, is that, as I said, there's been a massive resurgence in the past several years of the Latin Mass. And that's nothing to do with Pope Benedict, who is still alive, by the way. That is a cultural phenomenon stemming from the fact that people realize how hollow modernism is. A being with my colorful background, you know, I'm not criticizing the Second Vatican Council. I don't criticize it in public. I don't criticize it in, in private. I, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about my own thing here, but, you know, there were things that happened in that Second Vatican Council that were obviously going to create division. And they did. And so 60 years later to say, well, uh, real, uh, yeah, recognizing and trying to cherish the old ways, that's causing division. It seems a little disingenuous, I think. Critics said they had never before witnessed a pope so thoroughly reversing his predecessor. That the reversal concerns something so fundamental as the liturgy. While Benedict is still alive, no less, and living in the Vatican as a retired pope, only amplified the extraordinary nature of Francis's move, which will surely result in more right-wing hostility directed at him. So, Pope Benedict is alive, if you didn't know. He is Pope Emeritus. He never actually stopped being pope. There are really two popes right now. Benedict is alive. He is living in the Vatican. And Pope Francis has just given the most massive middle finger to a living pope, uh, basically in history, saying that this signature decision where you're going to allow the Tridentine Mass, the Latin Mass, is no more. We're going to, uh, they, at ABC News' own words here, not mine, we're going to crack down on the spread of the Latin Mass like it's some kind of rebellion. Which, I mean, maybe, you know, we're not taking a side here. Maybe it is a rebellion against the Novus Ordo, the New Order, the Second Vatican Council created. Francis, 84, issued a new law requiring individual bishops to approve celebrations of the Old Mass, <clears throat> also called the Tridentine Mass, and requiring newly ordained priests to receive explicit permission to celebrate it from their bishops in consultation with the Vatican. And that's why we are discussing it on this program. Not because Tiger and I are both Catholic, but because this is about law. Canon law. This is about a law issued by the last monarch, the last absolute monarch on earth. The Pope. Under the new law, bishops must also determine that the current groups of faithful attached to the old mass accept Vatican II, which allowed for Mass to be celebrated in the vernacular rather than Latin. These groups cannot use regular churches. Instead, bishops must find alternate locations for them without creating new parishes. So, in other words, there's a church that does the regular, not the regular, the new Mass that everybody thinks is the regular Mass. You walk into a church a Catholic church, they're saying the Mass in Latin, I mean, uh, excuse me, they're saying the Mass in English, the Mass in English, and they are facing you, the audience. Uh, that's the new Mass. That's not the regular Mass. They have that, and then once a week, they'll have a special Mass. They'll have people come in from out of town, of a priest and a deacon come in from out of town. They will do the Latin Mass, facing away from the audience, facing the altar, but now, according to this law, they can't do that anymore. They can't have those guys come in and just do the Latin Mass on a Sunday. They have to do it somewhere else. They've been, I mean, by all appearances, they've been outright banned from the church. And they have to go find a new building in which to perform the Latin Mass without creating a separate or new church. 
it's uh, I, just short of it's a hair short of being outlawed, really. In addition, Francis said bishops are no longer allowed to authorize the formation of any new pro-Latin mass groups in their diocese. Again, you've been effectively outlawed. From this point forward, you're not allowed to form any new Latin mass groups. And the Latin mass, that there's so few of those churches already. Yeah, I mean, well. it, it, I mean, I, I'm even lucky that there's one within 100 miles of where I am. I mean, if there, I haven't been able to, I mean, I know for a fact there isn't any others anywhere, anywhere at all near where I am. So for the Latin mass, you've got to hunt them down. Yeah. Without the internet, you'd be in a pickle. Oh, but, oh yeah. yeah. But yeah, the internet uh, is out there. You can find a Latin mass near you. Um, but it's a totally different world going into a, a Latin mass church. And I, that's kind of the point. That's why they're running it out. They're, they're not welcome. It's like, uh, reminds me of Brave New World, where you know, you're allowed to go be an outlaw on that island somewhere, but you're not allowed to live in society. And the noble savage. Francis said he was taking action to promote unity and heal divisions within the church that had grown since Benedict's 2007 document, Sumorum Pontificum. He said he based his decision on a 2020 Vatican survey of all the world's bishops, whose responses reveal a situation that preoccupies and saddens me and persuades me of the need to intervene. The Pope's rollback immediately created an uproar among traditionalists already opposed to Francis's more progressive bent and nostalgic for Benedict's doctrinaire papacy. This is an extremely disappointing document which entirely undoes the legal provisions of Benedict's 2007 document, said Joseph Shaw, chairman of the Latin Mass Society of England and Wales. While Latin celebrations can continue, the presumption is consistently against them. Bishops are being invited to close them down, Shaw said, adding that the requirement for Latin Masses to be held outside a parish was unworkable. This is an extraordinary rejection of the hard work for the church and the loyalty to the hierarchy which has characterized the movement for the traditional mass for many years, which I fear will foster a sense of alienation among those attached to the church's ancient liturgy, he said. Benedict had issued his document in 2007 to reach out to a breakaway schismatic group that celebrates the Latin mass, the Society of St. Pius X, and which had split from Rome over the modernizing reforms of Vatican uh, Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council. But Francis said Benedict's effort to foster unity had essentially backfired. The opportunity offered by Benedict, the Pope said in a letter to bishops accompanying the new law, was instead exploited to widen the gaps, reinforce the divergences, and encourage disagreements that injure the church, block her path, and expose her to the peril of division. Francis said he was saddened that the use of the old mass was accompanied by a rejection of Vatican II itself with unfounded and unsustainable assertions that it betrayed the tradition and the true church. Christopher Bellito, professor of church history at Keene University, said Francis was right to intervene, noting that Benedict's original decision had had a slew of unintended consequences that not only created internal divisions, but temporarily roiled relations with Jews. Francis hits it right on the head with his observation that Benedict's 2007 loosening of regulations against the Latin Rite allowed others to use it for division, he said. The blowback proves his point. The blowback was indeed fierce, though it's also likely that many will simply ignore Francis' decree and continue on as before with sympathetic bishops. Some of these traditionalists and Catholics already were among Fr Francis' fiercest critics, with some accusing him of heresy for having opened the door to letting divorced and civilly remarried Catholics receive communion. <coughs> Which, again, is why I don't criticize the Second Vatican Council. Rorate Celi, a popular traditionalist blog run out of the U.S., said Francis's attack was the strongest rebuke of a pope against his predecessors in living memory. Francis, quote, this is a quote, Francis hates us, Francis hates tradition, 
Francis hates all that is good and beautiful, end quote, the group tweeted. But it concluded, quote, Francis will die. The Latin mass will live forever, end quote. This is all in all caps, by the way. Yes, thank you. Yes, <laughs> it's very emphatic. Mesa in Latino, an Italian traditionalist blog, was also blistering in its criticism. Quote, Mercy always and only for sinners who are not asked to repent, but no mercy for those few traditional Catholics, end quote, the blog said Friday. For years, though, Francis has made known his distaste of the old liturgy, privately labeling its adherents self-referential navel-gazers who are out of touch with the needs of the church. He has cracked down on religious orders that celebrated the old mass exclusively and frequently decried the rigidity of tradition-minded priests who prioritize rules over pastoral accompaniment. Traditionalists have insisted that the old liturgy was never abrogated and that Benedict's 2007 reform had allowed it to flourish. They point to the growth of traditionalist parishes, often frequented by young, large families, as well as new religious orders that celebrate the old liturgy. The Latin Mass Society claims the number of traditional masses celebrated each Sunday in England and Wales had more than doubled since 2007, from 20 to 46. So that alone goes to show that this nonsense about the Second Vatican Council is going to open the doors to everybody and bring everybody back to the Catholic Church and we're, you know, the, the numbers are going to explode because we're going to do things like the Protestants do it. Clearly, empirically false. But you see, yeah. since 2007, the numbers actually reversed. Once Latin Mass was allowed to flourish again, those numbers really did double. So I know even the uh, Latin Mass church that I go to, they recently had to move out of their church building and use their use another building that they own, a, a much larger one. It, it was a gym. It was their gym. They had to convert their gym into a sanctuary with an altar and everything there just to accompany all the new people that keep coming in. Yeah. There's a, an old law, uh, not in the church, but in marketing and propaganda, that you have to differentiate. If you're exactly like your competition, then what's the difference? Yeah. <laughs> Except the price, right? The price becomes then the only difference between you and your competition. So if you change the liturgy, you no longer say it in Latin now, you say it in English, like everybody else. You say it in Spanish and in Italian and in Chinese and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you no longer have the Latin mass. That's one huge thing where you're, well, whatever. Well, I could go to an English mass anywhere in America. Why do I have to go to the Catholic Church? You change it so that the priest is no longer facing the altar, but now he's facing the people. Well, what's, what's the difference? I can go to any Protestant church in America and the priest is going to be facing me, talking to me. You change the liturgy so that the priest is no longer making a sacrifice at the altar during Mass, which is what the Latin Mass is, but now he's facing the audience and he's breaking bread and now it has become a meal, like the Passover, which is what the Novus Ordo Mass is. Well, then what's the difference? Why not go to a Baptist church? Episcopalian, Methodist, Presbyterian. Why would I go to the Catholic church? They're doing it just like everybody else is doing it. And then eventually it comes to communion. Because really the entire point of mass is communion. The entire ritual, the whole rite, the sacrifice, the altar, the prayers, everything comes down to communion. Because Catholics believe that it's a real thing. There's a real miracle taking place at every single Mass. Well, not in Protestant church. There you just take a wafer and you take grape juice. It's symbolic. So eventually you break down the language, you break down the liturgy, you break down all the steps of the Mass, and it becomes just like Protestant Mass. Well, eventually people are going to be like, well, wait, why do we... What, what miracle? What are we talking about here? What's the difference? It's just, it's just grape juice and a wafer. And then, you know, marketing aside, 
um, you've lost your way. But still speaking in terms of marketing, your one differentiating factor between the Catholic Church and the entire world is the miracle of transubstantiation. So this is a massive blow uh, to all of that. Anyway, to conclude the article, <clears throat> but for many, the writing was on the wall as soon as Francis stepped out onto the loggia of St. Peter's Basilica after his 2013 election without the ermine-trimmed red velvet cape that was preferred by Benedict and is a symbol of the pre-Vatican II Church. The restrictions went into immediate effect with his publication in Friday's official Vatican newspaper, Los, Ver Los Servatore Romano. Sorry, it's been a while since I practiced my Italian. Anyway, what's interesting is that... <clears throat> Ratzinger uh, was actually part of the Second Vatican Council, and years later, as he developed, became a cardinal, etc., he realized they had probably made some mistakes changing things in the Second Vatican Council, and so when he became Pope, he was the one who tried to bridge that, or make that bridge, rather, um, to all those people that felt betrayed by the Second Vatican Council, and now, now it's full-on repudiation and you gotta think there would be no reason for a crackdown at all if there weren't a real resurgence and it hadn't become a threat to the oh new yeah order. yeah yeah that that that's a great point i mean there, there yeah exactly there wouldn't be a, if it was the opposite if the latin mass was dying out nobody cared about it right yeah. If it really was just a bunch of divisive weirdos and right-wing lunatics, you know, piddling off in their own little parishes that nobody cared about, then who would care? But the fact that numbers double when you bring Latin mass around, that there was a massive resurgence, that it proved that the Second Vatican Council did not do what it said it was supposed to do, that's a massive threat to the New Order and to Pope Francis personally really because um, his whole agenda like this ABC News article says his whole agenda was antithetical to anything traditional did you hear about how Tolkien preferred the Latin mass yes I have heard <laughs> I mean, about that I read that story yeah, actually how he, he would be uh, reciting they, they, his church switched to Novus Ordo and he was reciting all of the lines in latin out loud and just like loudly so everybody could hear it yes i love that it's just like of course tolkien would prefer latin <laughs> well of course he was a cultured educated man yes but uh, yeah i think it was his son or his grandson who relayed that story and he said that tolkien just uh you were completely oblivious to the fact that everybody else was doing it in english like he was just saying it really loudly like this is how it's done didn't even care that everybody else is doing it a different way now well that's that article let's check the chat radio silence i think something happened with my computer tiger can you still well me? yeah i can hear yeah, you you can hear me all right so i think something got rebooted here on my computer but here we go Uh, Why did you go Catholic and not Russian Orthodox? Well, I got my reasons too. Well, why don't you both of us? <laughs> or I'll answer anyway, even if it is only directed at you. <laughs> yeah, what's what's your uh, what's your reason? Um, really, it for me it was there, there's a lot of reasons, but the biggest one is actually just accessibility. I mean, yeah. Greek Orthodox churches here, but um, it, it's just like it's it's too foreign. There's not there's not as much accessible material about it, and and Latin. I like Latin. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, saying it's foreign is, I think, accurate. I mean, the Orthodox churches are ethnic. They're the Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, I'm neither Greek nor Russian. My name is clearly Latin. Uh, I, I originally, 
I went through RCIA over a decade ago, back when I was in law school. And uh, I chose the Catholic Church for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, I went to school. Um, I think the question really is, why would I go back to it after having been apostate for so long? I think uh, I'll wait for the book to come out for that. I'm going to have to write about that one. It's been a long, long year and a half. And uh, it's been a story, guys. Anyway, let's read some more news about that. Oh, one thing I wanted to start off with. Did I send you this one about Illinois, Tiger? <clears throat> NPR. Illinois, yes. Yeah. Yes. I got it right in front of me right now. So this is an NPR article. And yeah, I know it's NPR, but it's also NPR, you know. So Illinois is the first state to tell police they can't lie to minors in interrogations. You might remember that movie Blow, uh, where he's like, are you guys cops? You know, you have to tell me if you're cops. And Johnny Depp's like, do we look like cops? And they're really not, but there's this urban legend that if you ask a cop, are you a cop, they, they have to. That's rid just ridiculous. I won't say it's retarded. It's ridiculous, okay? No. Cops do not I mean, have good to tell thing, you, you they're know, cops. Whenever the police come and do a sting operation, the criminals could just say, hey, are you a cop? And then that, that, they'll sniff them out, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's amazing people don't just ask more often, are you a cop? I mean, think of all the problems that would solve. <laughs> Undercover's BTFO, right? No, they don't have to tell you. Cops are legal. I suppose you could make that argument, but minors, really, you are literally picking on a child in an interrogation, tricking them into telling you things. So, Illinois, I gotta say... You know, sometimes I I do love Big Brother. Sometimes I feel like a straight liberal. When something like this happens, and I'm thinking, it's about bloody time, Illinois. Like, where have you been? Uh, Illinois Governor Pritzker signed a new bill into law Thursday, barring police from lying to underage kids during interrogations. Imagine that. I, I, I read something like this article, and I think... Why would this even be necessary to sign a bill like this? But we live in a police state, which we love. People fall for that every single day in this country. And you know what? If they're an adult, you know, you've been told since first grade that they're going to do this. If you tell them anyway, I, I don't know what to say to you. You've heard it a million times here on Crime and Punishment. Don't talk to the cops. Your lawyer talks to the cops. That's your lawyer's job. Don't do it. But if adults do it, they made their bed, I guess. They can lie in it. But when they do it to underage kids, they trick these teenage kids saying, look, man, you cooperate with me. Just tell me what I want to hear. I know you think you didn't do it. I, You know, I know you've got, you know... Jimmy and Johnny or whatever, whoever they are, there's, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if you tell me what I want to hear, I'm going to make it better for you with the prosecutor. The fact that we have allowed cops to do that to underage kids for so many years disgusts me and should disgust you too. Here's the other one, insinuating that incriminating evidence exists. So cop is in there interrogating. We've allowed that. Finally, Illinois is saying, no, you can't do that. According to the Innocence Project, an organization focused on exonerate types of interrogation methods have shown to lead to false confessions. They've also played a role in about 30% of all wrongful convictions later overturned by DNA. So, yeah. Tiger, did you keep up with that Bill Cosby circus? I know he was yeah. released uh, recently, right? They straight up let him go. Yeah. So I remember, I, th I think it was the New York Post. I think it was, I'm pretty sure, because it had that like Spider-Man type 
Daily Bugle headline looking thing and said villainy. And everybody is furious that Bill Cosby just walked because he confessed to it after all. Now, Bill Cosby might be more sophisticated than the average Joe. Um, probably has got better lawyers. I don't know. But false confessions exist. Time. They say things. They admit things they never did. They confess to things they never did. And it's all because of police interrogation tactics. So do you know anything about that confession of Cosby, by the way? Uh, yeah, actually, um, I was thinking of talking about it on this show. So I have a few things prepared for it. All right. Well. But the the um, that the prosecutor initially told cause the first there's been multiple prosecutors the first one said he would not prosecute cosby if he would just i, I don't think they asked him to confess but what i but what ha ended up happening was that cosby relied on the promise to not prosecute and by saying incriminating things in the civil trials that he was involved in. And then a new, different prosecutor came in and charged him and created the criminal trial, put him in court. Mm. And now on the appeal, the Pennsylvania Court of Appeals, they they said, you can't do that. He relied on us to, to not prosecute. It violates his uh, Fifth Amendment rights and everything like that. And just completely overturned everything and he's now free good for them good for them yeah yeah i mean i i love this uh, that a that they'll still follow the letter of the law even i mean i know there's there are people out there saying that cosby is innocent maybe he is but i mean just against the entire public backlash the court just is following the law i, I love that yeah that's a rarity these days so, all right, well, so people do confess to all manner of things they didn't do. And it's not just Cosby. I'm the people I've seen do that, both as a lawyer and as an inmate. I've seen it just countless times. People are like, I don't want the food here. My life is falling apart. Um, I can't pay the bills. I'm about to get evicted. I can't get out of here on bond. Um, you know, child services taking my kid. Whatever it is, my wife is leaving me. Uh, I'm going to lose my job. Whatever it is, they've got to get out of jail. So they take a plea. So that's one of the main tricks the prosecution has. Just keep you there without bond. Force you to take a plea to something you didn't do so you can get out of jail and fix your life. No one ever writes articles about that. Yeah. Or they'll drag a case on for years. They'll hold that over somebody's head, the threat of prison, for years. And I don't know. I, I don't know if prosecutors just don't understand the kind of stress that it causes somebody to hold something like that over somebody's head for years. Maybe they don't understand because it's never happened to them. Or maybe they use it because they know full well that that's what's going to happen. You threaten someone with 30 years in prison and then say, well, well I don't know, this is an awful old case. How about we just do probation, you know? And people will take that plea. If they're looking at 30 years in prison if they lose a trial and you offer them probation... After they've been dealing with this for two or three years, they're going to take probation. Nine times out of ten. Because they just want it over with. They don't want to go to trial. They don't want to face 30 years. You know, doing something like that would be heroic. People just want to get on with their lives. They want to raise their kids. They want to go to the Christmas pageant. They want to go to work. They want to watch Netflix. No one wants to deal with any of this garbage. And prosecutors know it, and they use it, and it is the most unethical thing in our legal system. Anyway, Illinois once was called the false confession capital of the United States, the organization said. That is the Innocence Project. 
because of a number of high-profile exonerations of people who falsely confessed to crimes they didn't commit. In Illinois alone, there have been 100 wrongful convictions predicated on false confessions, including 31 involving people under 18 years of age. So a third of these wrongful convictions we're talking about, predicated on false convictions, a third of them were children, said Lauren Caseberg, legal director at the Illinois Innocence Project. Well, that's kind of the point of that article. I, we've got a lot of articles yeah. we should probably talk about. Point is, every state should follow Illinois' example. You shouldn't be able to lie to mine. Oh, you know what? That's why I want to start off with this first, because my son's listening to this program. And I remembered today, um, or was it yesterday? I was driving in Orlando. Yeah, it must have been yesterday. Because um, I was driving with my son's the baby boys, not the older ones. Anyway, I remember this time on International Drive. I was 17 years old. And we went to this McDonald's on I Drive all the time. Me and my friends. Or my friends and I, excuse me. We would go there just hanging out. Uh, we were all ROTC kids. All of us were straight edge. Um, and one night... Out of the blue, uh, I'm walking up to the door, and this these two cops are standing there by the door. And uh, I'm walking up to the door, and the cop says, what was that you just threw? I was like, what? What are you talking about? I didn't throw anything. So I just saw you. I just saw you flick that cigarette. You smoking? What are you carrying? Like, I don't smoke, man. <laughs> what are you talking don't. I certainly didn't throw any cigarette. I wasn't smoking. I don't smoke at all. And he's like, I just saw you throw it. You call me a liar? I'm like, look, man, I'm going into the Navy like next week. I don't smoke. I don't know what you want me to tell you. And he's like, oh, well, in that case, I'll take your word as a man if you're going into the military. <laughs> and I'm like, why didn't you take my word as a man to begin with, you scumbag? You absolute scumbag. And this is, this is the Orlando Police Department. This is what I've been dealing with my entire life. I remember another time when I was 13, walking through downtown Orlando, and uh, this cop comes up trying to search me for cigarettes. I, just the darndest thing. I've never in my life smoked cigarettes. And these cops in Orlando Police Department, they'll just come and search you on a whim. Any teenager. Um... And that was back before I knew all these things. So I let this guy search my backpack when I was 13. And that, that was really the beginning of my hatred of the Orlando Police Department. Point being, know your rights, tell the cops no. And when I say I have a, an ax to grind with cops, it started when I was a kid. And that's why I wanted to read this article first. Because this is not something out of the ordinary where cops are like, oh, well, it's a huge murder case, and we've got to lie to these kids to get them to confess. Or, well, there's a huge international drug trafficking RICO thing with human trafficking, and this is so huge, and we've got to lie to these kids. No. They treat kids like this every single day. These cops are absolutely out of control. They lie to these kids. They get them to falsely confess to things they didn't do. They jam them up. They destroy their lives. They do it without their, their parents present. Cops are absolutely out of control in this country. So, you know, we talk a lot of trash about Illinois, especially when you go to law school in Chicago, as I did. But this is a step in the right direction. I think all states should follow Illinois' example here. You should not be able to lie to minors in an interrogation to get them to confess to something they didn't do. Because it's not about this massive international conspiracy it's usually about weed or some traffic violation or a battery or whatever else. It's never as important as the cops would have you believe. It's only important in perpetuating the police state. You know, your stories remind me of when I was a teenager and I was walking with a friend of mine to his house and he has this big 
long one of those big long rural driveways going down a hill and there's a police officer sitting there and he asks us what are you doing here and he says this is my house what are you doing here <laughs> and the police officer is like, oh well i, I and he, he drives off <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Yeah, I have a, a very different story like that where the cops follow this kid home from the gas station. He's not a kid. He was like early 20s. They follow this guy home from the gas station and uh, run up to his truck on either side with guns drawn and force him out of the car. Arm bar him to the ground and arrest him for, uh, for resisting. Arrest him for resisting arrest oh, yeah. without violence. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that, that was something I've been meaning to ask is if you've ever seen police body cam footage where the police officer was not was arresting somebody and did not say, stop resisting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much every every arrest. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they know what they're do, doing because whenever and you see this oftentimes with activist footage too, the person with the camera, they like to narrate what's going on to the viewer. To it, It's kind of like whenever you're watching combat sports and a lot of combat sports, they know like turn off the commentary because it's going to cloud what you're see, watching. It's going to cloud watching the fight. Uh-huh. And, I was actually I thinking of some body cam footage every now and then. Just turn it off, and is that guy really resisting? <laughs> yeah, I was actually thinking of Family Guy when Peter starts narrating his own life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just as ridiculous. Oh, look at that! Look at that! Uh, Officer Juarez is taking him down to the ground. Yep. Oh, he's definitely resisting. Look at all that resistance he's giving. Look. Oh, look, that's resisting. We gotta get the taser out. That's basically the play-by-play. Play. Yeah. So, earlier in the Telegram chat, um, I had sent you some news on the FBI agents. Did you see that fiasco? I gotta say, I have not. All right. I'm gonna send it to you again, because this is super important. We gotta talk about this tonight. Um... There's the first one. FBI agent... No, sorry. FBI agent in Whitmer kidnap case arrested following domestic incident. Huh. So this fake kidnapping case in Michigan that the FBI straight up made up and they were half the participants in this kidnapping. At least two of them that I know of have come under fire for misconduct uh one of them one of those acts of misconduct being domestic violence imagine that so that's uh agent richard trask 39 of kalamazoo michigan so what's interesting is how this ties in with another fbi agent involved in that case who is on an audio recording talking about how they are deliberately going to cause chaos and disorder for the defense agents in the very case that they are accused of misconduct in. I mean, it's like the plot of a a movie. Like the FBI agents make up this fake plot for kidnapping, set these guys up, and then they start derailing the defense and then it's like training day, you know, like it, and then it turns out they're really the criminals and one of them gets arrested uh, for domestic violence, like, you know, which I'm pathologically skeptical about after what has happened to me. But uh, all of this corrupt and the, the news, the left wing news reporting on this FBI corruption is totally out of the ordinary. Um, I don't know what to say about this. I mean, they're actually reporting on the misconduct of FBI agents who were setting up alleged white supremacists kidnapping people. I mean, amazing. Yeah. 
I mean, it, it's amazing on a couple counts. One is that it's being reported on. <laughs> yeah, because usually the, the media would be happy to sweep this under the rug. Well, they're doing God's work, you know, taking down those evil domestic terrorists. But in this case, even the left-wing media is saying, well, I don't know if these are the good guys. So, the arrest of an FBI agent credited with helping thwart a plot to kidnap and kill Governor Gretchen Whitmer complicates one of the most closely watched cases of violent extremism that is becoming increasingly focused on allegations of wrongdoing by investigators. This is the Detroit News saying that. FBI Special Agent Richard Trask, 39, of Kalamazoo, was charged Monday with assault with intent to do great bodily harm, less than murder, following a domestic incident with his wife Sunday. He was released on a $10,000 personal recognizance bond following an arraignment in 8th District Court in Kalamazoo and faces a charge punishable by up to 10 years in prison. <laughs> Look at this guy's picture. He's yeah. like a- you know Instagram what? ethos. Yes, he is. Look at me. <laughs> as a matter of fact, as you were saying that, I was copying the link so I could post it in the chat. <laughs> Hold on. Gotta get out of that. So that you guys can see this e thought FBI agent posing with his bicep pose here. I think he's got like a training company, if I remember correctly. Like a, a physical he's like a CrossFit. That's what it is. He's a CrossFit instructor. <clears throat> His arrest comes at a critical juncture in the criminal case against five men charged in federal court with plotting to kidnap Whitmer, that is the governor. Defense lawyers last week leveled a broad attack on the foundation of the high-profile case and suggested a second FBI agent was trying to sabotage defense teams. When I first read that line, I was like, I must have read that wrong. That sounds crazy. Uh, as Cesare would say, that's so crazy. <laughs> because the the defense lawyers are accusing the FBI agent who set this case up of sabotaging their defense team. That's insane. Like, what an allegation. That's something, you know, just unheard of. That's not even professional to say something like, like that. But check this out. I'm not even going to finish that story. I'm going to go to the story that this is referring to. FBI agent audio raises questions about sabotage in Whitner kidnap case, defense suggests. A lawyer for an accused bomb maker charged in the Governor Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping case raised questions Sunday about whether the FBI is trying to sabotage defense teams ahead of a landmark trial. Oh! Oh! That's the Detroit News saying that. That, It's phenomenal. It's astounding that the left-wing news is attacking the FBI. Not, well, it appears to be an attack just because they're even talking about it. Because, like I said, usually they look the other way when the FBI is out of control. And these guys are reporting on it. That's amazing. They're actually reporting, like, Not, look at these lunatic defense lawyers. Look, they must be right-wing maniacs who listen to InfoWars. They're making these baseless claims. They're actually saying, well, no, this is what they're saying. And uh, this is what the audio says as well. A filing by the attorney for Delaware resident Barry Croft revealed the existence of a recording Sunday in which the lead investigator, FBI Special Agent Henrik Impola, discussed creating, quote, disarray and chaos for defense lawyers, whom he labeled paid liars. Defense lawyer Josh Blanchard included excerpts from the recording in a court filing Sunday that asked U.S. District Judge Robert Jonker to have prosecutors produce a witness list by late August. The request comes despite concerns about the safety of confidential informants and undercover FBI agents who helped infiltrate the alleged plot last fall and whose names would be expected to appear on a witness list. Defense lawyers are not entitled to witness lists in federal court, though judges have discretion to demand the list be shared before trial. Blanchard, that is the defense lawyer, cited an audio recording of Impola and an unidentified informant who described being afraid of his identity being made public. 
The recording was made in December during an apparent strategy session, Blanchard wrote. Quote, having done this with a lot of sources, we can cloud the water, Impola told the informant. Quote, and it can be completely, we can send everybody into disarray and chaos, where the last thing they're worried about is your name. End quote. It was unclear how defense lawyers obtained the audio and whether it was provided by the government along with evidence collected during the investigation. In another excerpt Sunday, the FBI agent was quoted saying, the, quote, best chance is to create utter confusion and chaos, end quote, and also told the informant defense lawyers involved in the case were paid liars whose job was to take the truth and portray it in a different sense. An FBI spokeswoman could not be reached immediately for comment Sunday. There is no indication the agent's intention to create chaos and disarray is shared by federal prosecutors, Blanchard wrote. However, this is quote, however, it appears that his behavior has infected the discovery produced by the government, as demonstrated by the disorganized and highly duplicative way it was produced, Blanchard wrote. He pointed to certain files being shared with defense lawyers 16 times. One 40-minute audio recording was produced 15 times with 15 different file names, Blanchard wrote. The request is the latest legal development in a high-profile case that has focused attention on anti-government extremism in Michigan amid fallout from lockdown orders aimed at stemming the spread of COVID-19. So, <clears throat> a federal case, especially one of this magnitude, is going to have a lot of discovery. So they're saying certain files being shared with defense lawyers. So when they send that discovery, uh, you know, they're sending a, a hard drive, a one terabyte hard drive with hours and hours and hours of videos and audio. And they're sending thousands of pages of documents on this hard drive. Sometimes literally millions. Yeah. I mean, I've seen that already. Yeah. Massive hard drives full of data. You got to get teams to comb through this stuff. You got to file motions just to specify, all right, what am I supposed to be looking at? They deliberately avalanche you with these things so that you don't have a chance to defend your clients, right? But in this case, they went even further. He's saying that this audio recording was named 15 different times and 15 uh, with 15 different names. It appears that this FBI agent who was outed as saying that he wanted to create disorder and chaos for the defense team, it appears that he has had an influence in the discovery process. I I would love to see what happens with that. But the fact that the left-wing media is even reporting on this is incredible to me. So that is what is being referenced in this new case where another of the FBI agents has been arrested for domestic violence. Trask, who's the domestic violence arrestee, 39, has worked for the FBI since 2011 and served as the FBI's public face in the Whitmer case, testifying in federal court about the investigation. He has worked on cases involving espionage, terrorism, and domestic, terrorism, uh, domestic extremism investigations. <clears throat> it's the last thing you want for a major case like this, said Andrew Arena, former special agent in charge of the FBI's Detroit office. Any time you give the defense any ammunition, it's not good. <laughs> That not that just something an FBI Detroit office special agent in charge would say? You can't help the defense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially not when your agents are engaged in misconduct or illegal activity. It's amazing that that's where his mind goes. Not this poor woman or, you know, what about the moral character of our special agents? No, it's you're giving the defense ammunition. That's the first place his mind goes. I love that about him. Details about the incident were not available. Trask did not respond to a message seeking comment Monday. Good idea. And there was no defense lawyer listed in court records. <clears throat> FBI spokeswoman Mara Schneider said the Bureau is cooperating with the prosecutor's office. Trask's job status was unclear Monday. In accordance with FBI policy, the incident is subject to internal review, and I cannot comment further at this time, she said in a statement. 
That review would include an investigation by FBI Internal Affairs, Arena said. Depending on the severity, it could be a suspension until things are ironed out one way or another, Arena said. Aside from his FBI duties, Trask opened a gym at his rural property in Oshtimo Township near Kalamazoo and offers CrossFit training, according to social media posts and state business filings. He filed state paperwork for BCB Health and Wellness last year and maintains an active Instagram account showing him exercising, flexing, and <laughs> posing shirtless. I almost feel bad running this guy through the mud. Yeah, uh, I, so, I mean, to be fair, you know, women be crazy. I mean, it, it could be entirely That's what false. I'm saying. It could be uh. just completely made up, which... Yeah, that's what I would lean toward. But yeah, that's why I feel bad about it. Like, I, 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 I feel bad because I don't feel bad because screw this guy. Because I know that he was involved in this fake kidnapping plot. And it's one of those things where you're like, well, you get what you deserve. But at the same time, that's exactly what people say about us. When people on the right wing get arrested. And they're like, well, I don't care if he did it or not. Screw him. These people are evil. They should go down by any means necessary. So I, have, I don't want to make I, fun of this guy. I just yeah. have a problem with his Instagram. I know. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm saying. Know, what? Yeah, it's like that that comic where it's like, oh, women taking a picture of something. And they always have to have their face in it. I mean, this is him showing off his gym, but he has to put himself in it and do selfie mode. It's like, not a picture of the gym. It's him in the foreground. I can't even see the gym he's trying to take a picture of. <laughs> yeah, I see like a poster of a guy and a. There's a rack. It looks like it might be a squat rack. I don't know, but yeah, it's definitely a picture of him, not the gym. But yeah, I don't know, man. I feel. I'm conflicted about dragging this guy through the mud. I guess we'll uh, just leave it at. There's a lot going on in this case. And in high-profile media cases, you can almost guarantee that the cops are lying about something, if not everything. And by cops, in this case, I mean FBI. So the fact that... Yeah, and I remember when this news first broke when it was like all over the news are oh, these uh, white supremacist right wingers magapedes are gonna kidnap governor gretchen whitmer because you know they say mean things about her on the internet so they're gonna go kidnap her you know i, I remember all that and and now i'm pleasantly surprised to see news actively reporting that the fbi is involved because i mean this is something that us conspiracy nuts have been talking about for 20 years the fbi creates these scenarios and uh, it used to be entirely in the realm of conspiracy theory and here's detroit news talking about it yeah i saw recently a meme about uh subway sandwiches and people complaining about subway sandwiches like bro you made the sandwich and uh it cuts out the text and it says something about the fbi complaining about domestic terrorism and <laughs> says bro you made the sandwich like yeah fbi has been just making these things up for decades now they just they go in they have the plot they recruit the people they provide the funding they provide the details they provide the logistics and boom the people whom they recruited <coughs> Which is the yeah, same trap. I mean, Infowars made documentaries about this. I mean, it's a... yeah. That... So, all we're saying is uh, maybe think twice about what you hear in the news about that kidnapping case with these FBI agents who are clearly corrupt. And again, half of the kidnappers were FBI agents, from what I've come to understand. It's, what, a, what a ridiculous situation. The truth will out, as they say. All right, what are we going to talk about next? We got, uh, how about Hunter Britain? We said we were going to talk about Hunter Britain. 
yes. a couple weeks ago. Find out what happened there. And uh, actually, uh, it looks like BLM is taking up Hunter Britton, this white kid. Yes. From yes, nowhere, that Arkansas. Yes, that's the thing. I'm at his funeral, Al Sharpton and Ben Crump. So Ben Crump, he's the attorney that's always in these cop shoots black guy cases. Here, here he is, and Al Sharpton speaking at Hunter Britton's funeral, speaking out against uh, uh, police violence. I mean, it, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> I mean, I, I have some conflictions about that, mostly because I'm not entirely sure how I would feel if, like, my kid died and, like, essentially media personalities show up at the Ouch, funeral. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> well. I, I would I assume I mean, that they invited them. I don't think they could just show yeah, up. Yeah. So you know, one thing that you often see in uh, true crime, especially in with missing persons cases, is the parents. They really do want media exposure. At, at least I know this for the missing persons cases for sure, because they're they're just like get the word out there. Somebody find my kid. I want to be on Doctor Phil talking about it and everything. <laughs> Hey, um, kid dying? I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, why? Well, yeah, missing kids, that's a different story. I've uh, donated a lot to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I've done fundraisers for them on Instagram. That's a serious topic. But yeah, I would imagine these guys were reached out to and they said, yeah, of course, I'd love you know, Reverend Sharpton to come down or whoever can bring attention to this because from what I understand once this kid was shot there were protests at the police station there in Arkansas but who cares it's a white kid in Arkansas nobody cares you know so I'm sure when they get reached out to and somebody actually does care shoot man I, if that happened to my kid I'd probably have Reverend Sharpton talk at the funeral because somebody then would care you know like yeah your, your yeah, child exactly. dies it, it nobody actually... cares and finally finally after all these years of well this degenerate and that degenerate are shot and there's riots all over my kid dies i want somebody to care you know i can understand it where they're coming from attention to exactly the people who would otherwise never hear about it i mean al sharpton and ben crump fan club they're they're, they're following all of the police officers shooting the blacks and this is going this will expose hey it, this happens to whites this is a problem everywhere yeah which is what right wingers have been saying at least the far right for years the main yeah. criticism is being look yeah black people get shot by police but it's not a racial thing everybody gets shot by a police we live in a police state that is the problem and that this is a this is an incredible development where it looks like for just this one shining moment in history everybody can join hands and say yeah this is not a racial problem this is a police problem this is a serious legal problem not a political one and we have to stop cops from doing this so what happened? We, we were all wondering what happened when we first heard about this. Apparently, this kid and his friend, another kid, were working on a truck at 3 in the morning. Because why not? They're teenage boys working on a truck in Arkansas. Whatever. Cop comes up. The kid puts a, not like a gas canister, but like an antifreeze canister or something behind his tire so that the car won't roll into the cop car. And the cop unloads on him. Shoots him in the neck. Unbelievable. Although it is believable. Like, you see a lot of these um, incidents, right? They're caught on the body cam. Every single time there's a cop shooting an unarmed person, he's a coward. Or it's a woman. It's somebody who is just scared, pissing their pants that someone's going to pull a gun on them. They have no self-control. They're scared out of their minds. They're shaking. You can hear their voice shaking. And the minute they do something that scares them, they unload. They're weak. They're cowards. Yeah. That's how this happens. 
And, and you know what? Um, my, my dad, he uh, he's obsessed with watching westerns, cowboy westerns. Like, like it's literally the only thing he watches. He has a satellite channel, and it's only on the western channel. Like Sicario. And so I've seen a lot of those old western movies because of that. And I just think this genre should probably make a comeback because you see a lot of this moral code that's, you know, you don't shoot an unarmed person. You never shoot a person in the back. You you see a lot of that moral code spread. And I I feel like more people should be aware of that. I mean, you know, I I, I don't know. I mean, that's how I feel. I I agree. There should be. I believe in honor very strongly. I believe in it. Yeah. That's the old America, buddy. We live in Big Brother's America now. And I don't know if I sent you this, but I know when we were talking about Hunter Britton last time, you were asking about the body cam footage. <clears throat> there is no body cam footage. Really? Yes. Eh. So I sent this to you again, just in or I don't know if I sent it to you the first time. But Which just, article was it? So I, I probably there, have it. I just dropped it on you okay. now. Arkansas deputy fired for not activating body camera ahead of teen's fatal shooting. All right, the headline uh, says it all. <laughs> so there really <laughs> wasn't. I, okay. Because yep. I remember uh, when this first happened, the sheriff, I, I believe... Maybe I maybe I'm misremembering this, but I thought they said they were turning over the body camera footage to yeah, the state. That police. was in the news. They were saying they were going to turn it over, and then they find out it was never even turned on. There I was see. no footage to turn over. <laughs> I see. So that's what he's fired for, not shooting the kid in the neck. That's interesting too. But oh well, I'd say I won't beat up on the guy, but he should be beat up on. He shot a 17-year-old kid in the neck for putting a, an antifreeze canister behind his tire. Yeah, you know. I, I mean, there, there's some... That I feel like, um, you know, it, it. this can be the most moral, upstanding officer in the world. But, I mean, sometimes you do make one big mistake, an honest mistake, and it's very bad, and you have to pay for it. That's literally a life and death mistake yeah yeah um i feel like we said we were going to discuss a bunch of stuff we were going to discuss oh trump's coup d'etat we were going to discuss the closing of the loophole for concealed carry here in florida oh man all right long and short of that you're allowed to conceal carry in florida if you have a permit uh, this is not legal advice, by the way. If you have questions about your specific legal case, you should consult a lawyer. Feel free to consult me by writing me at InvictusPA at ProtonMail.com. This program is for entertainment and educational purposes. It is not legal advice. That being said, you can conceal carry here in Florida if you have a permit. However, there's also a law here in Florida that says you can't carry on school grounds. So... They've just closed that loophole for churchgoers. So there are churches um, that have schools on the same grounds because they're Christian schools or Catholic schools inside of the church. So you can't conceal carry to church because there's a school on the grounds. Well, we've just closed that loophole. Now you can carry to church so that you innocent churchgoer sitting at mass can't just get blown away by somebody walking in the door with a gun so it doesn't matter if there's a school on the church grounds now now you are allowed to carry to mass yeah but you have to remember that churches are hallowed ground (laughs) yes please tell me you get that reference (laughs) highlander Highlander, uh, yes yes yes. (laughs) Oh, man, that took me a minute. Yeah. (laughs) Well, anyway, thank the Lord for that. Um, All right, so the last thing, man, we've got three minutes. I wanted to lead with this, but this is, we're just going to blow through this now. 
Uh, Ex-Joint Chiefs Chairman Mike Mullen. Incredibly disturbing that military leadership reportedly feared Trump coup. That's actually not the one I wanted to watch. Oh, I even downloaded the video. We can't watch the video. <sighs> How disappointing. It's CNN. CNN I wanted to do. They're not going to effing succeed. Top generals feared Trump would attempt a coup after election, according to new book. So, this book, uh, I Alone Can Fix It, is about everybody in power thinking Trump was going to uh, execute a coup d'etat after the election. The top U.S. military officer, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Mark Milley, was so shaken that then-President Donald Trump and his allies might attempt a coup or take other dangerous or illegal measures after the November election that Milley and other top officials informally planned for different ways to stop Trump, according to excerpts of an upcoming book obtained by CNN. The book, from Pulitzer Prize-winning Washington Post reporters Carol Lonig and Philip Rucker, describes how Milley and other Joint Chiefs discussed a plan to resign one by one rather than carry out orders from Trump that they considered to be illegal, dangerous, or ill-advised. It was a kind of Saturday night massacre in reverse, Lonig and Rucker write. The book I Alone Can Fix It, scheduled to be released next Tuesday, chronicles Trump, that's tomorrow by the way, chronicles Trump's final year as president with a behind-the-scenes look at how senior administration officials in Trump's inner circle navigated his increasingly unhinged behavior after losing the 2020 election. So, <laughs> we... This is an ad, by the way. <laughs> you said an ad? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. CNN is clearly I mean, one advertising of the things this. people don't know about news is that oftentimes people... I mean, I know business owners. They, they go and pay a newspaper to go and print an article about the news of their new product or whatever the same thing you, you get authors doing this too <laughs> yeah this is by jamie gangle jeremy herb marshall cohen elizabeth stewart and barbara Starr. five people came together to write this article on a book it's clearly an advertisement right so uh i want to get the book i've actually already requested it hey so I think we'll just wait. We're already out of time, and I wanted to go through the chat anyway, so we're just going to have to sit on this and uh, come back sure. to it once we got the book. Where, sure. did, where did OBS go? There it is. All right. Cops do buy and bust, where they ask if you can get them weed and then arrest you for the favor. Yes, they do. Um, are you doing anything special for your birthday? Asks Storm Hunter. Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, I will have all my kids on my birthday. These days, I'm such an old man and a family man that I just, uh, being with my kids is the only special thing I do anymore. <laughs> That's, uh, especially since jail. Um, there is nothing else outside of that. So that is my special plan for my birthday, which happens to fall on a Saturday this year. <clears throat> um, new ideas. Sorry for being off topic but it appears you went through a traumatic experience with your family. How did you deal with the pain of a divorce with children? Thanks. How did I deal with it? Well, part of it was in maximum security isolation. Starving to death having no idea where my kids were. There's really no way to, to dull. You just survive it, really. And they say that uh, you know, as time passes, you get further and further away from it and things change and you'll feel better as time goes on. Um, quite frankly, that's absolutely false. In all of that time, that pain never once lessened in the most minimal way. 
in uh in jail really all you can do is push-ups and read the bible and uh <clears throat> just survive since getting out of jail I, I could write a book on that on how you deal with the pain of a divorce with children and uh, everything that's happened um but I think, really, I uh, not to turn this into the Catholic program tonight, but really, um, prayer has been the only way of dealing with it. And uh, basically just suffering like you're in purgatory. And I read a lot of business books. I don't know if y'all listen to the old programs before Crime and Punishment, but I read a lot of business books. And... Uh, I still read a lot of business books to this day. And a lot of the business wisdom out there, you know, guys like Tony Robbins and Jim Rohn and Earl Nightingale, Napoleon Hill, the business wisdom is that uh, if you cannot change your circumstances, then it is you who must change. And I think the past year and a half has been one giant, massive kick in the pants about that lesson. If you can't change your circumstances, it's you who must change. There really is no way of dealing with that. To answer your question, new ideas, you just survive it. You just get through it. And uh, now that we are through it, I tell you, I don't ever want to th think about it again, quite frankly. It's, uh, it's a different universe. It's all over. It's over. It's over. Like, my kids are back. I have them home. It's, uh, man, what a life. I, uh, I don't even know what else to say about it. Everything is, it's like, uh, you came out of hell. It's like, you know, when they put Bruce Wayne in Bane's prison, it's like, that's where you were. And you finally got out of a hole. Like, you have a whole new lease on life. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I guess I'd have more personal advice for how to get through a divorce with children um, if I knew the specific circumstances. But that's about all I can say at the moment. Anyway, um, all lives matter, y'all. Black lives too matter. Big brother ain't my brother. Let the catechumens depart, and the ancient liturgy meant that they would go out and guard the entrance with swords. That is an epic way to end this evening's broadcast. Yes, most based and liturgy pilled. So, with that, everybody, have a good night. Thank you, Tiger, for joining me. And uh, we will see you all next week. Let the catechumens depart.